Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to CMS. My name is Andres. Uh, My name is Sonia. We're going to be your guides today. Um, so we yeah, are, <laughs> we have Sultan here and Noemi is behind us. And um, yes, we're hoping to show you the CMS detector uh, at what, as we call it, 0.5. Um, Sonia, do you want to say a couple of words about yourself? Yes, okay. <clears throat> so uh, as Andres said, uh, my name is Sonia, I'm coming from Italy, even if uh, now it's a long time, I'm here uh, CERN based. And uh, today I will be your guide, uh, uh, underground guide. So you, I will try to, to show you uh, through the camera, but okay, from my point of view <laughs> and my enthusiasm, what, what is uh, underground, uh, how the detectors, uh, the detector look like. Um, I'm a particle physicist, uh, better, astroparticle physicist, uh, which means uh, that you are a particle phys a physicist, but that your detector is installed in space. And uh, this is because at CERN we have an experiment uh, we host the control room of the, uh, this experiment, uh, which is uh, uh, partly um, as a participation from US because uh, as a NASA participation, now we celebrated this year the 10 years in space because uh, it's installed on the International Space Station. But basically what we receive are data here and uh, they are particle physics in any case. <laughs> uh, but I enjoy, in parallel with this, I enjoy communication and uh, to talk with students. And this is why I'm here, because I'm also a fan of CMS. You <laughs> also because it is easy from the experiment AMS, so you just change CMS uh, yes. and you get, <laughs> you get CMS. So I'm a fan of CMS and I'm happy to be here uh, and to show you the Before we would start, yeah. I have a technical remark mm -hmm. that uh, since we have uh, only physical presence schools uh, uh, or connections, please don't hesitate to cut in whenever you have a question. You don't need to wait for the end. This is not a talk. This is a virtual visit. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Enjoy. We encourage your questions. So uh, just very quickly, my name is Andres. Uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and at some point I uh, decided to pursue particle physics. And as a graduate student, I spent some time here at CERN, and I've, you know it's fantastic, the, the work that is happening here. And we'll talk about uh, exactly that, what's the kind of work we do here at CERN. And uh, at, at this point, I'm a postdoc, and I'm based here in the Geneva area. and uh, I can talk a bit more about the kind of work that I do if you guys are interested, but uh, perhaps we can just go ahead and get started and uh, there's plenty of stuff to show you. Yes, so maybe exactly. we can, I don't know if you want to show the control room and then. Yes, exactly. And I, uh, first of all, I will prepare myself because I have to wear for safety and I'm not, I have already wear, uh, I already my shoes and uh, yes, I. I think I we joined, should start with this share. Yeah, okay. I joined Sultan to... saying that if they want to interrupt, because we want to meet with you uh, guys, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, virtual visit. It's not our virtual visit. <laughs> okay, so I will, I will move from here and I will see you in okay. few minutes. Okay, so sure. I think we can yeah, discuss a little bit about VLHC and about CMS in the meantime. So, um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping you guys are at least, at least a little bit familiar with uh, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, but you may have seen this image at some point. Um, so this is a, uh, a picture taken from the Jura Mountains, which are actually just over here. And you can see the Alps further out in the distance, and you can see the Geneva Lake. So you see this yellow ring? Uh, there's not actually a, a yellow ring on the surface. It's just painted there to give you a reference. Uh, but this is this represents where the LHC, uh, the tunnel is, but it's not on the surface. It's a, a, about 100 meters underground. If that was a yellow ring, it probably it would go through my living room. <laughs> I wouldn't appreciate. <laughs> yeah, well, this is something that's, that's very interesting. Uh, about the LHC is that the facilities are mostly built underground and people live in the area and there are farmhouses and uh, yeah, you can see that all of these facilities are underground. 
So uh, this, uh, you know, on my drive here to P5, you can see, you know, some cows and there's a lot of tiny small towns that are very, very charming. Um, yeah, this is sort of the look. Uh, and here's another thing that's very interesting if you didn't know this. Uh, so CERN is really uh, in between France and Switzerland. That is, it crosses the border multiple times. Uh, you can actually see that border, Sultan is uh, sort of highlighting it with a mouse, so that white dotted line is the border. So um, I, I happen to live in France. On my way to CERN, I might cross the border. Uh, and if you're inside of the CERN campus, you might cross the border, border several times. Um, so it's, it, it's kind of a prelude or, or just a hint of the international nature, nature of the experiment. Indeed, the CERN oh. campus border crosses through. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, maybe we can go to the next slide and I'll tell you, tell you a bit more about the OHC. Yeah. So I wanted to also mention that, you know, CERN has been here for a long time. It was founded in 1954, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And there has been a number of experiments. And again, this is a, these are all very international efforts. In fact, the you know, CERN was founded after the Second World War in an effort to sort of rejoin uh, collaborative science uh, in Europe, but also around the world. So there are some experiments that were originally uh, built around that time in the late 50s that we still use. Of course, they have been upgraded and, uh, you know, they don't look exactly the same way, but we have the proton synchrotron, which is in use to this day. And at the time, the proton synchrotron was the most powerful particle accelerator uh, of its time. And uh, in a similar way, after it ran its course, a bigger accelerator was built. And I'm not gonna go through all of them because there's been several of them, but I'm gonna highlight the SPS. Uh, the SPS is, you know, you have the PS, the proton synchrotron. You add a super at the beginning and you've got a, you know, <laughs> the, the bigger collider, the you know, newest and brightest. But we are not we HPS. Okay, perfect. But we are not HPS. H hyper proton synchrotron. Oh, we don't have a hyper. Well, <laughs> maybe we can suggest that one for the future. Um, so yeah, the SPS was, uh, yeah, started operations about in 1976. And uh, it was, I mean, this is a very historic uh, accelerator. And there were two experiments that were run at this facility. and there was there we had the discovery of the vector bosons which sorry for cutting yeah i will just remove the share but you can continue your sure so yeah in the sps we had the discovery of the vector bosons and that led to the nobel prize uh, for two people that worked at CERN at the time mm -hmm. so um you know fast forward a few years after that and we have the lhc it also has a, an interesting history um so I think I'll come back to that. I think maybe, uh, Sonia, you can describe what we're looking at right now. Yes, I didn't want to disturb you. <laughs> I was showing, maybe you saw, I was showing the coffee machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, the I most important this, part. Exactly, we have two, three. This is one of the most important things we have here in the control room. And then you see different posts. Maybe you see many screens. Okay, but the most important is the shift leader, which is here. Now consider, okay, the, hi Francesca. <laughs> Any news about uh, the, the detector? You can tell us. Part of the detector is on, the thing that you see in green is on, and we're going to do a test with the cosmic rays later today. Okay, so this is the activity of CMS, but it will be inside okay we will not try not to disturb anything with our presence thank you francesca and then you see zoltan uh, our your speaker andres and then i move to the other part of the control room which is this one this is dedicated to the to the different uh, sub detectors so you see there are again many screens and that each post is uh, related to a subdetector. Take care of the subdetector. For example, as you see here, we have 
what we call ECAL, which is the electromagnetic calorimeter. I guess that uh, later when I'm going down, Andres will explain uh, all the subdetectors of CMS. So he will give you a short idea about these uh, objects. Now I'm proceeding uh, towards the door, which uh, will bring me underground. So I'm just passing. Can you still hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. OK, thank you. Thanks to thanks, I'm checking. So now, where I am here, I know that for you it's fine. But for me, it's very noisy place. So I had to adjust my volume. OK, where are we are? Here is the first door I had to check to enter the experimental zone, OK? This door, I will show you. I have uh, Noemi with me. She will, uh, so I will, uh, I will check and she will keep uh, the camera. So, OK, here I am. I am my dosimeter. I have to check here and then enter the door. This door has uh, three checks. The first one is a weight check. Maybe you can see. I don't know if you can see there is a, a square. Uh, a, there are some lines, so you see some dots, uh, yellow dots. And uh, there is a square. I have to put my feet on, the, on this uh, uh, zone. And then, uh, OK, I will never know my weight, but however, <laughs> fortunately, but however, they will check if I'm human. So if I'm not introducing any material, this is the first check. Then there is the biometrical check, which is this machine, you see, uh, here, you see, this machine. Uh, this will check my iris, which is on the CERN database, to recognize that I'm, uh, I'm Sonia. And then, OK, there is somebody going out, so I will wait to enter. And the third check, you see, we stay in uh, is uh, an infrared beam check, <laughs> which uh, is uh, checking behind the, uh, and the, um, if we are bringing any material, for example, a backpack, because I repeat that this is a door for people. I will show you the door for material, okay? So I will enter, I hope. The system will allow me to enter because sometimes it's tricky. I'm going in. I gave if you access closes, right, Sonia. Yes. Okay. The, I'm lucky. The door. If the door closes, it means it's fine. And now, okay, Aris, check. And uh, I'm in. And now it will be the time of uh, Noemi. Uh, we. I cannot take uh, the camera, so I have to wait on the other side. You will not see anything. Just because uh, uh, due to these uh, beams, infrared beams, uh, Noemi has, uh, to, has to put the camera in a certain way, otherwise she cannot uh, go through. So she is just, she's okay. And now we go, okay. We are, we are now in the experiment. Not not underground, but in the in the surface experimental zone. So first of all, I will call the elevator. Okay, you see it's now at minus two, so about minus ninety meters underground. I will call the elevator to go down, and I will show you this blue door. If you would have been here in person, this is uh, the door we use uh, to let visitors uh, getting in. Why? Because, uh, of course, we cannot uh, check your eyes, Iris. This is only for people uh, working here. And this is why we had to bypass the system. We have, uh, in any case, the doors, the green doors also in this side, which are here. We have two in this case, one on the left and one on the right. And uh, usually the guide checks uh, through these doors. And then uh, as uh, is in, uh, here you can see better this, uh, square i was telling you where we have to put our feet to be checked <clears throat> okay let's go the, the elevator is there 
And uh, the moment we are inside, so you see it's a big, it's a big elevator. Uh, now we can just fit five people because of the COVID uh, uh, rules and restrictions, but usually you can fit uh, 30 people huh? inside, uh, which are more or less uh, two groups of people because we have a rule of 12 people per guide in normal time. Now we go in, so I will, uh, you see we are at zero. Uh, we will push minus two, so we'll go to minus uh, 19, let's say and that the connection will be lost for a while. So I give the, the floor to Andres. Okay, great. Thank you, Sonia. So I'll Thank just you. say a few words. Uh, and as Sonia said, uh, you can see as the elevator goes down, but we expect to lose connection momentarily. Uh, so maybe I can say a few more words. Uh, you might be asking yourself, well, why is this all underground? Um, I mentioned that most of the facilities are about 100 meters underground. Some of them are even deeper, 150 meters or so, or even 50 meters. That, that really depends. So the, the tunnel is at a bit of a slope. So uh, you also might have overheard the shift leader talk about cosmic rays. Uh, so the the first thing I, I, for a long time, I thought the reason we have our detector underground is to shield from cosmic rays, which are just uh, events, you know, particles that are traveling through space and they hit Earth and we can, you know, they might interact with our detector. But even though our detector is 100 meters on the ground, that still happens all the time. So we are uh, about to do uh, what we call a cosmics run today and we can see them. So the main reason we're underground is because that's where the bedrock is. And we have these very, very, very heavy detectors. And you'll see how big they are and they need to be on top of the bedrock, which is the solid rock. The rest of the soil, especially in this area, is very soft. So that's the main reason we have to be so deep underground. Uh, Sonia, back to you. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm now at minus uh, 87.9 meters. <laughs> okay, so minus 90. And uh, I'm uh, just out from the elevator. And this is uh, called uh, the safety zone or underground, why? Because in this room, we are protected, for example, through this door uh, for, uh, for uh, these are fire doors, as you see. So they are very heavy. Um, this is just one uh, uh, happening. We can have uh, here because we have electronics, of course, but we have also, we are using also gases. And this means that we could have uh, some leaks uh, uh, let's say in my experience, it never happened. I never heard about this, but it, we have to think that it could happen. So this is why this part uh, is overpressurized, which means that the air is pumped outside. So if there is any leak outside in the experimental zone, nothing can enter. And this is the best place where in case of an evacuation, we can wait either to take the elevator and the go on surface or to wait for instruction from the fire brigade. We have also stairs, we will show you, but let's say that usually we shouldn't use stairs. It's forbidden to use stairs. You could imagine now I'm minus 90. So in average, one uh, floor is uh, considered three meters. This means that, okay, I should to go up, I had to run for 30 floors. Uh, let's say I'm different uh, young, but I think that even uh, young people is really hard. Also, if you know that you are in danger and you have to go up. So it's much better to wait here and to, uh, to wait for instruction for people. In any case, we are safe. We have uh, an extinguisher. We are trained to use the extinguisher. We can call the control room. We have also some mobile phones. So we can call directly the fire brigades. So if I pull this up, there is somebody from the fire brigades answering and telling me, what do you want from this specific place? We can also start if we see something uh, wrong going on, we can break this glass and push the button. This is the evacuation alarm. Okay, everybody is allowed to do this. Of course, there is a responsibility, but we can do. And uh, last but not least, we have also the uh, medical uh, 
the emergency, let's say, box where there is a defibrillator. And we are also trained as a first aid, just the basic, let's say, but we, we, should, we are able to use this in case of an emergency here underground. Okay, uh, I think I will enter the, uh, it's very heavy, this door. And maybe what we can show are two things. Ah, okay, we are lucky today, you see. We have, a, we have a, the crane. Uh, I don't know if we can show you, but okay, maybe you can see, I don't know. It's not easy. Uh, let me see if I can uh, with my finger. Okay, you see this uh, yellow thing here? Oh, no, okay. Yeah, this is uh, the crane. And this is because uh, uh, you see on the, maybe if you go up, we can show. You will see on your left a white wall, okay, on the left. And this white wall is uh, the wall of the, let's say, uh, the, the, the column, the, the elevator column where I was going down. And on the top, maybe you can recognize uh, some uh, light, a square, a lighter square, which is the surface where I, where I was uh, when I, I was going, uh, checking through the green door. Uh, I can I do not think uh, you can see the 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 cables, uh, but there is in case there will be any any usage of this crane, uh, we will try to show you, okay? Because in this in this moment uh, they are uh, bringing up and down material from the uh, the minus uh, one hundred, which is below me, ten meters ten meter meters below me, and uh, the surface. So it's a really uh, the normal working uh, working activity we have. Now I think we can uh, proceed. And now to proceed to the cavern, we uh, have to go through this uh, uh, room. We have two rooms, twin rooms. Let's say uh, one here in this level, and one on the top on the other level, which is at minus eighty. They are electronics. There is electronics inside. And uh, the two of them, they constitute what we call the level one trigger. Then when I'm inside, uh, maybe uh, Andres can help me because there is a lot of noise inside, much more because there are fun, to, uh, the cooling fan. We would hear you without any problem. Yes, I know, but the, the problem is that I cannot hear you very well. I, oh, I yeah, hear, sorry. <laughs> it's, all, it's also for me. I cannot really hear myself <laughs> very well. So if you can help me in the description of the, of the, of the, of the electronics, uh, I can promise you something. I will go where usually visitors cannot do. So if you think that this is only a virtual visit, yes, it is. But you gain something because if you would have been here in person, you would have, you have not be allowed to go where I will go now through the electronics and also in the experimental cavern. Follow me. Okay, so I think I can say a few words uh, yes. while Sonia shows us the go, go, go. service cavern. Okay, so I wanted to very quickly show you guys what the detector looks like. We, we have a cartoon here or a uh, or just a, a figure. And I would just say that our detector is a bit, we, we usually describe it as a cylindrical onion. So it has many layers that, many layers inside of layers inside of layers. And what I really wanted to describe to you is that a lot of these subsystems, as we call them, have to be uh, kept at very specific temperatures. And they need, for that, they need some specific cooling. They need to be provided with low voltage, high voltage, and then there's uh, you know, cables for the actual data that they're collecting and sending out. So there's a lot of infrastructure, and this is, I think, what's part of what Sonia is showing us. So if we go back to her image, mm -hmm. we can see, uh, in particular, some of these are, are fiber optics. And I believe these, in particular, correspond to the trigger system. So the trigger system is a very crucial part of the of our experiment and it basically is a filter so a lot of data comes in uh, you might imagine that uh, every second we produce uh, the equivalent of like you know tens of millions of mp3s right so this is about the amount of data we're talking about 
is we have a lot of information and we couldn't possibly keep all of it. So we have to filter out the events or the collisions or you know, the, the, the collisions that we're interested in, let's say. So that's what the trigger system is uh, doing, it's, it's designed to do. And it takes a lot of these fiber optics, they go through these boards, which are full of FPGAs, which are programmable uh, logic arrays. Uh, so what I find interesting is that a lot of these services have to be uh, custom built for the experiment. So there's a lot of institutions around the world that have contributed either to the design of these systems, the firmware or the hardware itself, and you have, you have very complicated systems such as these. We are actually using these for the measurement of luminosity. And uh, I have a few colleagues that work with these. And something that was interesting uh, that happened just a few weeks ago is they had to fix you know, their Andres, timing. Yes. Is this your system? Yeah, so or this, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it belong, it's maintained by my colleagues, not me personally, but you can see that it, it's very messy and I find I would, it remarkable. I would call it complicated. Complicated, yes, let's call it complicated. But it's very remarkable to me that they had to go in and find the correct cable and then add a bit of length to that cable to account or adjust the timing of the detector. So they were saying, we added a length of cable here to offset by one or two nanometers or something like that. So it's very, Can I say very something. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, okay. I, I, I would like to rephrase the, the complicated in the sense uh, I think that if you want to arrange in uh, a very suitable things uh, your t shirts or your sockets in, uh, in a place, uh, you need also to follow a pattern. So maybe. Instead, uh, I would translate the complication in following a pattern and uh, to be, how to say, uh, meticulous and to have a mapping. Because mm -hmm. this is, uh, uh, of course, if you mix everything, uh, you cannot uh, recognize uh, what you are uh, reading. For example, look this wall. This is my preferred one, not only because it's red. This is high voltage. But look, look here. Of course, you can imagine imagine that among these cables, okay, if you just overlap or you exchange just two, one we need and with another one, uh, you you get not only errors, uh, but uh, nothing it's working. So uh, it's really to be meticulous. I don't know. In my opinion, this is not complication. It's just uh, to follow a certain pattern. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. This is a matter of point of view, maybe. Yeah, uh, I, I think meticulous yeah, is a very yeah. accurate description. Um, but part of my, uh, I guess my point is that this, this detector is, uh, has a lot of systems and has a lot of, you know, you were just looking at the high voltage supplies that we use for what we call the RPCs, resistive plate, plate chambers, and these are part of the muon systems. Um, but there's actually just downstairs to the left, I don't know if we can show you guys this room, but there's a, what we call a gas room. So as another example, these some of the our detectors uh, use a mixture of gases. And this mixture of gases has to be very, very specific in order to maximize what we call the ionization, right? Or, or the way that when a, char a charged particle goes through it, ionizes the gas and we get a signal. So that has to be very carefully maintained. So now, do you want to tell us about um, the- uh, Yes, as you, our, were our... Talking about, uh, you were talking about uh, gases. <laughs> I was uh, just uh, crossing, uh, you know, uh, the description how to, uh, you, we had to wear the, the safety mask in case uh, of gas leakage. So people who, who are used to work here, uh, they have to, they have to, they have this uh, box uh, and this box as inside that uh, you see this system, uh, of course, okay. They usually, we are trained to be able to, to, to wear this in 30 seconds, but okay, usually we are not to use it. 
but we have to keep with us. And this is uh, just uh, what Andres was saying about uh, the, in the case of gas leakage. Not only you have to, of course, to evacuate, but you have also to wear this system. And you see also there is a pin for your nose and some goggles, uh, of course. And then there is also, again, uh, talking about the safety, we have this uh, closet with any many other things concerning the safety. Uh, here are some masks. I don't know if you can see there is a, some reflex on the on the on the on the glass. And then again, a defibrillator here. And uh, maybe what is uh, again a replica of the system, as I was showing you before. Also here we have another evacuation system, the fire, big, uh, the phone for the fire brigade, another phone here, the extinguisher here, and uh, this red door that maybe I can stop here and show you. And uh, if Noemi help me, I can go on the other side. So first of all, you see the shape. This is the shape of the tunnel of LHC because if you go through this door. Uh, you can reach the tunnel of LHC. It's not immediately. It's not that if you enter here, you have the LHC, but you can you can walk and uh, reach the, the, the tunnel of the LHC. Now, this door is very important. Uh, we are not to use it, okay? You see, it's also sealed here, but in case uh, of an evacuation, we can not only use the, 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 the way I was using up to now, which is on the back, but we can also use this path. There is another elevator. And so we can evacuate in, in, uh, through this other path. But of course, if there is no, uh, let's say, no danger to go back uh, to the elevator I was using before, we prefer to go on the other side. This is the reason why we can accept visitors here all along the year, even if uh, the detector is taking data. This is very important because the other three, okay, you know, uh, Andres was uh, describing uh, that uh, on the LHC, we have four detectors. We are on one point of, of the LHC. The other three detectors, uh, they do not have this, let's say this uh, backup. They have, uh, of course, a second path, but usually this path is, is going through the experimental uh, cavern. So, Visitor cannot uh, are not allowed to do this uh, just after uh, the beam uh, is stopped, and so they cannot go there. It's forbidden from them to go underground when there is data taking and the LHC is running. Here is different because the second path is completely detached from the experimental cavern. So, if you will, as you will succeed in the future, that you will be here. Please do, to, do not hesitate to come here to ask for a visit. If it's possible, you can access in any case. So in the mean, in the mini, at minimum, you can go underground, okay? And if you are lucky that there is no beam, you can even enter the cavern as we will do now. Now, what I will do, I will go through this corridor and this corridor is connecting the side I was, uh, was walking before Noemi is showing you, this is uh, the experimental cover. I know that they have a nice, uh, a nice uh, slide to show you. However, I was in the, uh, in a, sorry, I was in the service cavern before where there was the electronics and now I'm using the connection. This is this just corridor. on your right, Noemi could show the, the map. At the corner. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, yes, it was, it was there. I don't know if, she, okay, we can show here. So I can show with, yes, I was, I arrived from this elevator and now I was going in this direction, okay? More or less here we have uh, the red door, let's say, and there is a connection, okay? There is a connection here, which is this uh, corridor to go to the experimental cavern, which is this one. So we have two parallel caverns. So you see one it's longer, is for the electronics and those, the, all the facilities for, for the, the, the detector. And this other one, which is shorter but larger, is for the, uh, uh, the detector. And now I'm just going through this corridor to reach the, the detector. You see that, you can see from this picture, this is, let's say, the hole, the column where the elevator was. And here you see another hole. This is from where we will show you from where 
we have lowered the, the detector because the DCMS detector, it was built on surface. It was not built in the cavern, okay? It was assembled, let's say, the, the short, the small pieces, they were built in labs, but then it was completely assembled on surface. And then we lowered these parts through these big holes. You will see it's really huge. I will, we will try to show you. Uh, unfortunately, the perspective is not uh, helping us, but uh, let's, uh, we will try. Again, a door now is yellow. And uh, <laughs> each time I prefer to leave uh, the colors. Okay, we, I, was, uh, I was passing through a green door. Now there is a yellow door and there is also a red door. These uh, colors, they distinguish a different, different, let's say, levels of security of the doors. Zoltan, do you want to tell something about this? Yes, of course. The, <laughs> these, these colors are just like the traffic colors. Red means stop, don't go. Yellow means stop and think. <laughs> Green uh, <laughs> means you can go. This yellow stop and think means that you can go through these doors uh, during special conditions. Special condition is when there is no beam, where there is, when there is an access declared by the, by the uh, machine control, you should be. <laughs> and then uh, uh, you can go through. Otherwise, if you go through, or if you force the door, you shut down the full LHC. Of course, since we have several cameras around this door, all your motions are or movements are recorded. So if you if you do not behave, you have to have a, a good story to tell. Yeah, it's also interesting All that done. there's certain you can go through. You you should try again. There's certain yeah. special conditions, as you said, Sultan, where there is what we call a patrol. And in that case, uh, you're required to have a key with you. Uh, when when we when we stop between the beams and we do That's not right. declare as the green light what you see in yeah. the, the so these are very special corner. very special conditions exactly but I find it interesting that as as long as that key is missing there's no way to have beam in the LHC. this we had just a couple of weeks ago yeah we didn't do this for for more than two years and we just just fell out from the from the custom. And in these doors, what uh, Sonia will show you, just, just this is just next to her, we have keys that uh, physically cut the, the, the line mm -hmm. that allows the, the beam injection. So this is, this is a second line of, of uh, safety. Obviously, we do not want to get on the front page of the newspapers with yeah. this kind of door. So I, I think this is something we've emphasized quite a bit, is that we have a lot of, uh, you know, safety is incredibly important. Um, but I, I would say that our detector has a lot of possible dangers, right? So we've mentioned gases. We have, uh, you know, we use cryogenics. We have high voltages, uh, you know, working at heights. There's a, a long list of what we could call dangers. So we take extra steps to make sure that working here is very, very safe. And that means, as Sonia said, there's some trainings that you're required to, to have in order to even have access to these areas and so on. You made it. <laughs> But the, the other thing I was going to say is... <laughs> no, many... but you know, it was quite... Okay, the first time I, I can tell you, okay, it was green. Huh? The, the, the iris check was green, but it was rejecting me. I don't know why. But the first time I thought that as I was laughing about the description of the door, it was my fault. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know what happens. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it you know, this is, this is the, the nature of the comp compute, uh, complicated <laughs> computer systems. Uh, <laughs> This is a very tricky device, especially this reader, uh, Iris reader, works differently than the others. So but I have to say that I'm happy because this means that, okay, it's checking because otherwise, so, but it was quite curious because it was recognizing me and refusing me to enter. Okay, this was really nice. However, <laughs> so, Sonia is now about to take you guys to see the CMS detector. Yes. So, okay. So we are welcome. in. 
Okay. I tried not to show how, how heavy is this door because also of the pressurization we have here. Okay. Now we have the detector. Okay. Maybe we can show, we'll try to show you. I will be not uh, in front of the camera just uh, to show. Let me know if I'm, uh, I'm focusing the system uh, because of my finger. Why don't so, you go out from the visitor platform? You can get closer. Yeah, yeah, I will go. I wanted just to show, first of all, this uh, pipe. This is the beam pipe, okay? So you could imagine that this pipe is coming from here, and this is the LHC. Of course, so usually the LHC, you see some uh, other things around the beam pipe, of course, the, the elements for magnets or uh, uh, electro frequency cavities, etc. But however, this is the pipe of the beam, and this pipe goes inside the detector, and uh, there is another pipe on the other side. At a certain point, we will go. They meet in the middle, and there is a, the. You can imagine you have the collisions, okay? On better the bunch crossing from what, uh, where you get the collision. I want to share uh, show also this. Uh, uh, you see this uh, slice. Mm -hmm. This object that is cage, let's say. This is called the wheel, and in fact, I told you that the, the CMS was built, assembled on surface. Okay, and how we lower the, the detector? Consider that the total weight of the detector is a fourteen thousand tons. Is a huge weight. You cannot do, you cannot lower in one shot something like that. Of course, we needed uh, some uh, cranes, special cranes uh, from harbors. So these came from uh, the Genoa harbors, but these are what we call the wheels. So the detector was built in wheels uh, and uh, we lowered the uh, one wheel after the other to rebuild underground the detector. You see here another wheel. From where, uh, now I will not show you the shaft, this big hole, because it's on the top, we have a better view later. We will have a better view later. And uh, I will go now through. So follow the beam pipe and follow my finger. Here is the beam pipe, you see? Entering uh, again the other wheel, you see? And uh, now while we'll go out from the platform, you see now all the other wheels today are here. You see the sectors. Uh, here and now we'll go out from the platform. This is the region we can receive uh, visitors. Coming from now, from from now on, where uh, <coughs> Noemi is, uh, we'll enter a zone where you see no visitor beyond this point. Okay, this is all special for you. Follow me. I don't know if uh, Andres, you want to say something. Otherwise, I would sure. like to use one of my comparison concerning the 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 weight, because usually when we say big numbers, okay, uh, in the normal life, let's say, we forget about. Uh, sorry, I have to stop because that is something nice. You see, again, our beam pipe coming out, or better, entering. Uh, the detector okay i already i already i'm already on the other side of the detector the total length of this big cylinder is about 25 meters depending on from where you count and so here the particles they come from this side and they, they cross in the middle but you see now a wheel and maybe i can show you down this is the minus 100 Okay, we will go there. And okay, we have on the top, maybe I can uh, go up. And we will go so on the top of the detector here. Okay, I will proceed. I just wanted to say this comparison and then I will leave the floor again to undress. Is that usually we, they say in the common life, we, we talk about numbers that we forget about the units. Now, 14 numbers, 14,000 tons, it's really a huge weight. 
Uh, the comparison I would like to use is the city car. I know in US, okay, city car is a, how to say, bigger than, than what we have in Europe, but however, you really think about a small car, okay? Uh, and uh, I, have, I have an electrical car, for example, a Renault Zoe, and uh, this, uh, this car is uh, about one, one ton. Now imagine that this object, okay, is the detector, the diameter is uh, 15 meters, and the, the length, as I said, is, uh, is uh, 25 meters. I can show you again, more or less, the length you can estimate from here. You see this corridor. Now, uh, replace this uh, weight with cars. This means that you have a hill made of 14,000 city cars, which is, uh, this gives you really the idea how, which is this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this weight, how huge it is. And uh, there is another famous comparison we are using here is uh, to compare the amount of iron we have in this detector with respect to the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So here we have much more iron than the, one, uh, the, the amount of iron used for the Eiffel Tower. Now I will leave the floor to Andres and Tolton, and I will try to reach the top of the detector. Again, I remind you, this is not allowed to normal visitors, okay? And See take you in care, a while. And take care while you go up there and look around if the crane is moving. Yes, of course. And I have, of course, uh, Noemi helping me. She will tell me oh, yeah. if I can yeah, or not. Exactly, <laughs> okay. exactly. All right. So this is, a, this is a working environment just for yes. the others. This is a working environment. We have cranes running up and down, uh, always, we always have to take care extra uh, uh, to keep our health. So I just wanted to add uh, a few things. So that, that was a really nice analogy for the weight of CMS that Sonia provided. Um, uh, also, if I remember correctly, the, the figure that I've heard used very often is the weight, these 14,000 tons in total of our detector is about twice uh, as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. Um, but something that's interesting about our detector, Sonia mentioned there's a lot of steel in our detector. Most of it is in the muon system and it's part of what we call the return yoke, which is part of the magnetic system. And that accounts for 12,500 of those tons. So it's mostly due to this sort of outer layer of steel that we have such a large weight. So when you think of the CMS detector, it means compact muon solenoid. It's compact because as, as large as it looks, it is still about half of the size, roughly speaking, as the Atlas detector. Uh, however, the Atlas detector, despite being twice as big, it weighs half the amount. So our detector is very small compared to Atlas, but very heavy. Uh, the average density of the atlas is said to be lower than that of the water. So if we would put cling foil around, it might float. <laughs> uh, of course, our atlas colleagues are not very happy of this idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, I also and wanted to say a few up. words about the subsystem. So I started to say that CMS is like a cylindrical onion. So um, I wanted to very quickly give you a sense of what that means. So. We have, as Sonia described, this beam pipe. And around the LHC, normally we have two separate pipes that carry protons going in one direction and then a separate pipe where they travel in the we opposite direction. So those beam pipes then merge at places like CMS where we have actual collisions of, from these uh, bunches of protons. Mm -hmm. And once we have these collisions, we have on the order of 100 billion protons that are coming together. And out of those, maybe, let's say, at most, 50 of them will interact. So then the first part of our detector that they travel through is the pixel and tracking detectors. And these are made up of silicon sensors. So these are, you can imagine them as similar to your camera sensor. And they can detect the trajectory, or they try to reconstruct the trajectory of charged particles. 
So after that, we have what we call the calorimeter system. Mm -hmm. And there's two different types of calorimeters, but the, the main idea there is that they try to take the particles that are in Andres, can I yes. stop you on the calorimeter? Just sure. a moment, and then I will move from here. Now, I am not allowed to go more than this, okay? I cannot enter. Sometimes uh, I could also jump on the detector on the top, but now I cannot. Uh, you see, there are also something I cannot do. <laughs> but however, I would like to show you that on the top of the of the wheels, uh, we have uh, stairs, okay? And maybe it's also even nicer from this one, because I think here you can really see the wheel, okay? This is uh, just a part of the detector which has been uh, moved back uh, as in an accordion. And then when the detector will be closed again, uh, so ready to take data, this part will be pushed back against this one. So everything will be closed. Now, what I will, go, I will do, I will go, you see this orange uh, uh, part, there is a balcony. I will go there to show on the top the shaft. So the hole from where those wheels have been lowered to rebuild, reassemble the detector underground. Just uh, show. Yeah, yes. before you go, let, uh, if we turn the camera to the left, let me just explain yes. why, you are, why you are not allowed to go there. As yes. uh, probably we yes. already mentioned that we have a superconducting magnet that is soaked in helium, liquid helium, uh, in order to, to maintain the superconductivity. And everything is cooled down to 4.2 Kelvin. Uh, in order to, to able to, to always to, to soak the, the, the uh, niobium titanium superconductive material, we have to have a reservoir. And this is what is just in the middle of the, the, the screen. This is a five cubic meter liquid helium reservoir. And now it is full. So in order to be extra safe, we do not allow people going there. And that's the I know. <laughs> yes, thank you, Sultan, for your uh, explanation. I would say I know I'm enthusiastic, but I'm not able to warm this uh, tank of helium. <laughs> However, no. If I there is any <laughs> spills, I, I would rather rather think that that if and there is any spills, that would not no, be extremely just, happy. Yeah, no, you are right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. I also yes, I do course. see the other way around. I think they, this cannot cool me down. Yeah. I'm so enthusiastic to be here. You know, oh, yes. you know me. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so, and, on... Okay, you will see if we, with the magnets and the pins. Yeah. You will see how enthusiastic I am. <laughs> yes, I, I, we, we, we know you are. Uh, in the meantime, while, while Sonia is moving, I would encourage our audience to ask questions. If you have any questions, please. Yeah, please this would be a good now. time if you guys want to ask any questions. Yeah, I think we are we are close to the the time they the closing time they asked. So, so actually, I would like to to. Let ah, them. I will try to go faster then. But be take, I don't want be to very lose safe. Too much. Yeah, but, but say, uh, safety first, you know. Yeah, 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 of course, is that, of course. Is there a particular yeah. smell? Like, yeah. does it smell like metal? What does it smell like in the cavern? Ah, good question. Thanks very much. Actually, in the cavern, we have to have a forced airflow. This is what you see on the, the, in the middle of the picture in the shaft. These are, these are air ducts. Uh, we have to press down, pump down fresh air and extract the used air. Otherwise, uh, we would all drown there. Uh, so actually, the smell is, is the same smell what is on the surface. Yeah, I, <laughs> I wouldn't say there's anything very peculiar about yeah, it. Yeah. I think. No, uh, no. Yeah, I can't say. I mean, at most, there might be areas. I mean, it, it's almost like uh, not a construction site, but like an industrial site in a sense. There might be, you know, Oh yeah, smell of oil. the oil or, or the grease. But yeah, that things we use. like that. But otherwise, there's nothing really. Uh, I. This is not very relevant. Yeah, exactly. So, 
So, so in in it's in, normal as well, I would say. Exactly. Okay, if apart we from would, now that we have the mask, but however, yeah. <laughs> it's normal smell. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, mm, so no actually, if, if we say. smell of if we we smell the the so-called umper smell, then we all would know that something is going yeah. wrong. And maybe related to this, I've <laughs> ah, heard yes. people ask. I've heard people ask like, what is it? What's the sound like? What does it sound like? And it's just very uh, loud. There's many in the, you know, there's uh. There's many pumps that have to be going mm. for cooling and so on. Uh, so it's just loud and it's industrial mm. sounding as the way actually, I would describe it. Actually, the, the, the microphone of Sonia is a very good one. Uh, it's, yeah. a, it's an active noise cancelling microphone. You don't hear the enormous noise that is in there. We I have, hear totally yeah. <laughs> from here. <laughs> we, have, we have approximately 200 racks. Each of them, or most of them, is equipped with uh, with air turbines to to move the air to to cool the equipment inside. Each of them has a has a very peculiar noise. Uh, as Andres said, we also have cooling pumps there, especially for the tracker. Uh, they also have sound. So this is this is a very noisy environment. It's uh, however how it how it is um, how it uh, it has the impact on the the human. Uh, um, um, uh, perception. Uh, I'm a regular UX goer, and if I don't hear these noises, for example, at the very beginning of the year when we have the cooling maintenance, every all the turbines, all the cooling plants are off, and the 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 cavern is dead silent, and that always scares me. That yeah. suggests that something is going wrong. Wrong, exactly. <laughs> Uh, if I can make a comparison, maybe could be as uh, if you have, uh, for example, uh, uh, a fridge in the house and uh, you hear the, the engine starting in the middle of the night and now you multiply for, I don't know, 10 uh, or maybe, I don't know, 50. And this is uh, this uh, background noise you always have here with different frequencies, as you were saying, okay, there are very low frequencies, but also high frequencies uh, as uh, sometimes uh, whistle, but however, it's, uh, it's okay. Of course, if you have to spend hours here, you can wear protections. So this is, for me, it's not a problem just uh, to hear myself a little bit. So I, I was stopping here just to show you the shaft. So this uh, diameter, is uh, a little bit more than 15 uh, meters uh, because there is uh, the, the, the wheel, I will show you now, which is uh, just here, is one of the wheel of the detector, you see, uh, was uh, fitting almost precisely with this hole, all the wheels. I think and 10 now, centimeters were on each each side. 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters. Yes, only. exactly. What I would like to show now, going down, I have the chance uh, because, okay, the 10 centimeter Zoltan is talking about, uh, I can uh, show from here because the barrier is uh, was built just, uh, let's say, at the same level as the wall of the shaft. And then I have uh, the structure of the wheel. And then I will go now down, I will show you with my hand, which mm -hmm. I think uh, even if uh, we are giving uh, numbers, it's yes, always exactly. Uh, yes, exactly. Say, the experimental. Actually, actually, the reason for this was that uh, in, in a life of a heavy, uh, of a high energy particle experiment is, is the, 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 the biggest price tag is not on the detector, but rather on the civil engineering. Uh, this is really hard to believe, but that's the truth. Yes, this is the distance. Now, I don't have a big hand. Eh? Don't think <laughs> that, okay, my, I have a huge hand. This is a normal hand, okay? Now, so this, this is, is the distance. Yeah, so this is true for the, the vertical shaft, but this is also true for the cavern itself. The cavern is 52 meters long, if I'm not completely wrong. Uh, and this is not enough to pull apart all the 13 parts of the detector. Uh, we always have to be very, very careful in, in planning what to open, what to close, what, yeah. is, what so is to be done. In other words, you can never fully open the accordion. There's exactly. always some 
parts that are exactly to exactly. So, for example, on the positive end now, we are we are having this kind of issue. We would like to open the what is open now between plus one and plus two end caps, but we also want to open the plus one end cap from the barrel. In order to plus, do that, we have to close it. Plus HF. Uh, there's plus parts the of the HF. detector that are in this garage. So you see these yellow doors. Yeah, exactly. If you want to do anything in the opening, first we have to put away the HF detectors. So I would say we're running a little bit low on time, and I'm sure Sonia wants to show the paper clips. Yes, oh, yes. I, I, oh, yes. I, I, at least the two things uh, I would have to show. This is uh, because I have the chance. This was not on place the last time I came. You see, I was talking about. Uh, how they open the detector and they pull and push the wheels. This is the system. You see this uh, big wheel and you see this uh, system with the cables uh, and then I will follow the cables. So look, uh, they are going uh, up to be connected, you see. And this is how they pull the wheels. Now, how do they do? You see, one of the key points are these orange structures that they are called pads and if you see i guess i can go here there are some you see there is a system which is connected so through this system we pump a compressed there and this compressed there makes the system let's say can help the, the wheel to be a little bit how to say lightened i would say so you can really pull and push the wheel uh let's say easily of course easily under quotation but however this is the system because otherwise you will uh, uh free uh, you will get friction and uh, in this way we can uh, remove the friction let's say then uh, i don't know can we play here with our system or on the other wheel okay we have uh, some nice thing to show I will try not to lose myself with this uh, very expensive detector. So, Sonia, okay. I'm not <laughs> sure that uh, the grease has been cleared from the, the floor. Please be very careful. It might be slippery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will be careful. Now, we start with this detector. You see, this is a detector, okay, of what? Of magnetic field. Now, let's see. You see? Now, these structures, they still are magnetized because of the magnetic field we were using not only recently, but okay, I can even remove or put like that, you see? I call this the magnetic swing. And this is something I'm doing for a long time, okay? I enjoy a lot. Now it's really too magnetic to make it swinging properly, you see? But uh, let's see if I can do another thing I discovered very recently. Can we do uh, do here? No, maybe. No. I don't know. You no, have to here. do it on the edges. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But actually, you this see? permanent field is, is is very weak. It is uh, still enough. Yes, to but here I don't know if I can this. oscillate them. Yeah. You see? So, so that's the remanent field. Now our main magnet is off. <laughs> But of course, the iron uh, likes to keep some magnetic field. Even yeah. there. So I confess, mentioned. I confess, I know exactly the equation now dealing with this phenomenon. But uh, OK, guys, I enjoy <laughs> to see this. I enjoy this much more than equations, you know, or, or better. I know that I, stu I studied this equation, and this was not for nothing. I know the secret to why this is happening okay it's not by chance and uh, as i'm used to say this is physics physics means nature so you have to think that physics starts from uh, the reality what you have uh, around you and this is really nice look at this zoltana this can make me mad <laughs> <laughs> i think we lost her already <laughs> yeah. no 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 i'm here okay i will remove everything just to show you that i'm still myself okay. well this is how a physicist works i guess so <laughs> we often yes. get may i spend a few words saying that physicists they are creative 
whatever you do, okay, I'm an experimentalist, but uh, even a theoretical physicist, they are creative because if you have to invent a device, if you have to develop a, a new uh, method to measure or to detect something, if you have to create a new model of theory, you need to, to be a creative person, okay? So this is why I enjoy with this. This is, I told you, this is the reason why I studied the equations. They, it was not for nothing. I hope to have convinced you guys. <laughs> you convinced me long ago. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can see if there's any more questions. Yes, again. exactly. Yes, yes so exactly. if there are questions, Noemi is showing you other things. I think I we think have to session. start to get, come up, no? Yeah, exactly. I think you, you have a come question. Up. Yes, yes, of course, Nicole. Go ahead. Um, so two questions. All the iron is that for um the magnetic field to control the particles, and then could you talk a bit about the different ways that the particles are detected in the CMS detector? Sure. Yes. Let me just share one slide, and Andres can go ahead. Yeah, and I think these two questions are related. Uh, so we mentioned, I, I try to go through these different parts of the detector, the different subsystems. And here, what we're looking at is if you imagine your proton, you would travel into the page, let's say, and you would encounter protons going on the other side. So it's what we call a transverse view of the detector. So as I mentioned, the innermost part of the detector is silicon. Uh, we call this a silicon tracker. And we can detect charged particles uh, with this part of the detector. And one thing that we didn't really uh, discuss very much, but the magnetic field for us is, is crucial, right? So the reason we have this magnetic field is that charged particles will bend under a magnetic field. And the amount that they bend will tell us something about their energy. That means that you know, an electron that's traveling very, very quickly will go through almost in a straight line uh, versus one that's going very slowly will actually spiral. So this allows us to say something about the, uh, the energy of these particles. So then I mentioned there's the calorimeter and in the calorimeter, we can actually also measure neutral particles. And we have two sections of the calorimeter we have one that we call electromagnetic, and that's dedicated to measuring the energy of photons and electrons. And then we have the hadronic calorimeter. Uh, there we can measure the energy of particles that are made up of quarks, generally speaking. So what, what I would call quark and gluon interactions, this is how we determine those. And there's a lot of interesting things about each of these detectors that I'm sort of glancing over. But then we have the magnetic the, the superconducting solenoid, this, this magnet. And at that point, we're, you know, this superconducting solenoid is a cylinder that's six meters. It's a cylinder with a six meter inner diameter. And normally most of the particles that are produced in our detector, this is where they are stopped. At this point, most of the particles produced uh, are detected before they reach the magnet. So after the magnet, there's only two particles mainly that we that escape, let's say. And one is the neutrino, but the neutrino, we don't really have a chance to direct using our detector. Uh, we can't really directly see neutrinos. They just don't interact uh, often enough. But we have this heavy system, the muon system. And this is the one that has all the steel. And uh, you can actually see from this figure, there's a little dot that says two Tesla. So that's what we call the return yoke. So one of the important things is that we want to have magnetic field in that muon system because we want the muons to curve. So we still wanna have a significant magnetic field in the muon system. That's what allows us to identify the momentum, the, the energy of these muons. We want them to curve. So this is why we need that much steel. Principally, that's the reason is if we wanna retain a strong enough magnetic field, we need that much steel in the muon system. And there's many, many other details. I don't know if Sultan, you have anything you want to add to this sort of thing. Well, what we can just what we can just mention that the atlas uh, is built differently. But you mentioned that if you want to measure the momentum of the the muon, 
then you have to to have either so you have to to have a big bending of the path you can make big bending of the path with either with a very strong magnet in a very in a in a quite small controlled uh, volume or you use a much less uh, strong magnet or magnetic field but, then but you, you have to let it fly exactly. so that's the difference between atlas and cms atlas choose a less magnetic field they have two tesla field uh, of course, that's a bit complicated. Yes, we have to see the chat. Uh, um, sorry, oh, yeah. one more question. Yeah, go um, ahead. Can you just briefly mention exactly how you, I don't know how to put it, see the particles, like by what process are they detected? Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, uh, what is it very, that allows you to see them in the silicon? Let me just, let me just, let me just, so uh, let me just show you a visualization. We, yeah. We don't visualize all the, the events, just those ones that are interesting and only for the papers and only for the publicity. But indeed, what we need are the measured physical parameters of the, of the particles, uh, the post energy, uh, size of the, of the jet, the hadron jet, the momentum of the muon, the directions, etc. We, we make our analysis based on the numerical values. But uh, here is something, a nice uh, visualization. Yeah, so you can see these. Uh, just to very quickly add to that, for, for some parts of the detector, what's really happening is that these highly energetic particles are ionizing the material. So for silicon sensors, the silicon itself gets ionized. You have this, let's say, energetic high uh, charged particle and it kicks out electrons from the atoms in the silicon, and you can collect those electrons that are kicked out. And you can do that in the muon system, but instead of silicon, you have these mixture of gases. And for the calorimeters, it's a bit interesting because there you will have this kind of material that we call scintillators. And the scintillator, when an energetic particle hits it, it produces light. And depending on the amount of light, we can say something about the energy of these particles. And there's many, many other technologies, but those are is the quick summary that I would give you. Yeah, exactly. The the technology of, of uh, creating the, the values from the particle depends on the on the sub detector, almost as many sub detector as many technology as many sub detectors. And this is a big part of our work too is try to develop newer technologies more efficient. Uh, so this is also ongoing and we didn't even talk about future plans or anything. I guess we're a bit out of time but Yep. There's can, many, can, many more things. Can I just uh, say that we are simply copying nature? For example, the calorimeter, they, the work says uh, the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> so we didn't invent, <laughs> at least we invented a, a technology who is simply copying what nature is already doing. So when you have a proton coming from the space and is impinging the, the, the highest layers of the atmosphere, then it's meeting atoms or molecules of the atmosphere. And these, it starts to make some processes, okay? This is what we call a shower, really of particles. And this is what really happens, for example, in a crystal, we are here in CMS, we have a, a 17, no, 75,000 crystals, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So imagine uh, in one crystal, uh, you have a sort of a block, okay, a, a bar, and uh, inside when the particle is going in, it starts uh, to produce this shower, which is uh, basically transformed in energy photons. Uh, and then we have a system, of course, electronics, which is converting this uh, energy in, uh, an electrical signal, electrons, and then we associate, this is the calibration system, we associate the energy inside the, the, the crystal with a certain energy carried by a particle. And then concerning the silicon, okay, I'm sorry, I'm also critical about this. This is silicon, Thank you. guys. Um, this is oh, silicon. Wait, sorry, one more question. Yes, go, go ahead. ahead. Kyle. Um, what does it take to maintain the detector? That could be, it could take us 30 minutes to answer that. Or <laughs> yeah. So uh, generally speaking, many, many things, right? I would start by saying that we need to monitor the detector. We mentioned the calorimeters and we mentioned we have to keep it at a, a specific temperature. But for example, that this calorimeter system that Sonia was talking about, 
it's it's very interesting because these crystals are made of lead with a bit of tungsten in it and that means it's like a block of lead it's super heavy and dense but it becomes transparent and it produces this light the well, actually is, this was transparent when we made yeah <laughs> and, that's and my this point. will lose its transparency exactly so so as it by... as it ages as we say uh, it becomes less and less transparent, more opaque, and we have to measure how that happens and adjust our calibrations. And at some point, if I uh, just want to get back to the maintenance, uh, at some point we have to replace these yeah. these uh, 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 crystals. This will happen during the next long, long shutdown, I think uh, three, five years from now. Uh, and also during these long shutdowns, we, we, we maintain deeply the detectors, detector electronics. We, we add new detectors like the GEMS today. And, uh, and during the next shutdown, the, the new detector nose, which we didn't describe uh, too much today, um, but, uh, but actually we, we will get new things. This is how a, 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 an experiment lives. Apart from these long shutdowns, we have year-end shutdowns and the regular six weekly stops, beam stops. During these times, we can go in and do the do those maintenance works that are that are fitting in the time frame. And that's that's without even going into many other things that require such as calibrations that mm -hmm. uh, you have to run for the there's many, many things, you know, making sure you're providing enough high voltage or things like that. So it's we could talk about this for a long time, but and hopefully that's. We didn't, the didn't even talk <laughs> about the softwares. Yeah, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> okay, just, let's yeah. say basically that we have some, let's say, parameters, or some uh, indication we are always measuring, uh, which are telling us that, uh, okay, we can uh, continue to be confident about our detector or not. We have to, uh, to, to change or to do something else. This is basically, now, of course, this is done automatically, you know, mm -hmm. usually, but however, we need to, uh, to say, to somebody who is checking uh, and uh, controlling that everything is Actually, fine. Actually, the DQM shifter's task <laughs> is, is to do that during running. Sometimes it also happens that you have something wrong. You go with uh, the board, you change the board uh, because you, re you replace with another one, which is uh, you think is working. If you are lucky, if yes. you can't do this because the detector part just got inside. broken inside, ah, yes. you have to live with it. You have to introduce it in the simulations, etc. cetera. But this is to... what happens in space. Well, you yeah. cannot go with your screwdriver to replace You your... don't need so many people. <laughs> <laughs> of course. For the maintenance. So maybe a few more questions. Yes. I, I don't if, know how much If you have, have. A, uh, more questions, please go ahead now. About the detector, about physicists, yeah. uh, about your career here, if anybody interested, the possibility to come here from students. Unfortunately, by now, many, many of our contacts have to go. Nicole, go ahead. I have another question. Yes, go ahead. Oh. Sorry. Um, when, Push. when a detector like the CMS is uh, decommissioned, is there an alternate pathway for the protons to travel so other um, other detectors can keep analyzing data? I'm not sure that I understand. Is this about yeah. the data collected? Yeah. No, he's, uh, he's uh, yeah, it's probably hard to hear. He's trying to ask if CMS is shut down, can other detectors still detect collisions so like uh, yeah. no. is there an Usually alternate his question was is there an alternate they path could. the protons no. could travel exactly. when cms isn't working so Not in exactly. principle they could because they are completely independent from yes. us but since we are all uh, sitting on the same beam and if we want to access the if we want to access the the detector we cannot allow the beam circulating, yes, yeah. uh, they cannot work. So, so to put it in another way, there's no alternate path for the protons. They have to go through the CMS detector. The beam pipe yeah. you show. Yes, you but there's it. many things that can happen. You can, the LHC can make some adjustments so that we don't actually have collisions at CMS, but they may happen at Alice and LHCB. However, what happens at CMS is pretty much happening at Atlas at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that's a bit complicated. So the, this question is also a bit complicated to answer, but the main point is that there's no alternate path. You cannot bypass CMS. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, you to, have do to go through in any case. So yeah. you can, maybe you can stop, but, uh, and then as you said, okay, usually Atlas and CMS, they try always to collect data 
the same amount in the same time. Uh, okay, consider that this is, uh, I, I like to call a scientific competition. <laughs> yeah, but we are, we are solidarity. I don't know how it is yes. pronounced in English with each other. So if one of us has a major issue yes, that prevents us from, from running, then the, the other three rather stops and ask to stop the uh, and ask to stop the the uh, uh, the beam in order to be able to there is always the something to do if you stop the beam no no i mean uh, yeah. i mean if there is a major water leak or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. we all stop and, and let the the detector no, is not a this time is not wasted from the other experiments so they can check uh, correct uh, yes exactly something. yes okay. exactly they profit to do something yes exactly case, but yeah. this is rather solidarity mm. yes of course other. this is why i was saying <laughs> yeah. the scientific competition exactly. in the sense that okay of course everybody's trying to do the best is, but okay yeah, there i is think a this is a healthy competition yeah. okay. Okay. other questions can you i i I already know a little bit about it, but for the students, talk a bit about like how you can seal the beam is sealed, like the material that's used to let the beam go through the detector so that the beam pipe is still sealed, but particles can escape, if that makes sense. Particles can escape. There's yeah, a exactly. special material that they use that it goes through the detector, right? The beam pipe. It's a very good question. That's it's a very, very good question. Good question. Yeah. Sultan because... likes this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually, the particles might go through the material, so they can escape after the collision. But also, since the beam pipe is a is a passive uh, detector part, or or I don't know whose part is it, rather the the, the LHC, we want to minimize the the particle beam pipe interaction because that will bias our measurements. Therefore, we build the central beam pipe from the lightest available material from beryllium, and that minimizes the energy loss or particle direction uh, change uh, due to the particle just crashed into the beam pipe uh, uh, nucleus. That's very important. And this is one of the biggest questions of the accelerators and the detectors. So thanks for this question. This is one of the biggest, biggest questions. And just to add a little bit, so the beam pipe was just replaced uh, a few months ago in anticipation for the future. In the future, we're gonna have a different detector that goes very close to the beam pipe. So we need it to reduce the radius. Um, and yeah, that's the general idea. So you want to have the collisions and you want the particles to just punch through that beam pipe and not get affected. Uh, you don't want to reduce that interaction as much as possible. Yeah, we would like to have a beam pipe, yeah. transparent I, I beam just, pipe. Yeah. Exactly, it would be <laughs> nice. Actually, just, just one more remark on this. Uh, since it is pure beryllium and the beryllium manufacturing is extremely uh, uh, extremely hard, it's because of the the chemical poisoning. It's because of the the relativity of this material. The the manufacturing tools required it's very fragile, for it. no? exactly, and this is also very fragile. Uh, only three firms, as far as I know, are able to manufacture it on this globe. All are linked to nuclear uh, weaponry industry. Um, and so it is quite hard to, to deal with them. Uh, our beam pipe was manufactured in California. And they cannot make too many of these. This is extremely expensive, and extremely unique. only one. Yeah, it's very <laughs> unique, yes. It is also what means. I have a question. Yeah, yes. okay, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, how was the tunnel put underground when it was made? So um, I, I guess this means the LHC tunnel, but there's also the facilities here. And one interesting thing that I was going to say, I didn't have time to, is that the LHC tunnel was actually built for a previous project called the Large Electron Positron Collider. And the way that was done um, is essentially, uh, we go back to what Sultan was talking about, civil engineering. Yeah. So in the region, I mean, we we had uh, you know firms and companies that had the expertise to do this, um, but for the LHC there were many challenges in terms of the geography. And I mentioned a few things like the tunnel is tilted, 
uh, that has to do with the bedrock, but there's also, we have a lake and then some the Jura mountains that are very close by. So that all had to be taken into account. But essentially for the LHC, they just had to bore uh, you know, the ground and make these tunnels. For P5 in particular, there's many aspects. We talked about a few of them, but uh, for P5 here in, in CMS, for this main shaft, when they started to construct it, they realized that there was running water even before they got there. They, find, they found remains of a Roman villa, so they had to delay things for a bit. <laughs> then they realized there's running water. So it's not just that the soil is soft, there's actually running water under Indeed, the soil. that was an underground river. Yeah. So they had to, in order to proceed, they had to, so, uh, they had to freeze the soil uh, in order to dig through, and that made things even more expensive. Um, so there's many aspects. I don't know if Sultan you, or, or Sonia, you want to say any other details, but yeah, basic, for, for me, this is the hardest thing. Yeah, it's the hardest, but I have to say that when, uh, okay, I always found this uh, challenging, but then I had the chance to talk with uh, some civil engineering <laughs> engineers, and they told me that this is, okay, of course, not 100 meter underground, this of course, but this is the technique they usually use when they are building tunnels on the, in the motorways, for example, okay? And also, so, and also there, there are hotels in my, uh, my well, not hometown, but uh, our capital in Hungary, next to the river Danube, yeah. how it was built. So this is a normal thing, but it is done with brine that is salted water, cold salted yeah. water, but here it was not enough. And they had to change to liquid nitrogen. Yeah, I yeah, know exactly. Okay, of course, uh, these uh, then the, each site has uh, the peculiarity, but for them it was not so, let's say, no, the, the, exciting. Technically, this is not yeah. something uh, groundbreaking. But this also this means that uh, okay, <laughs> sometimes we think that the CERN only physicists that do things, but then uh, you see we need also civil engineering, engineering uh, to do other things. And then, okay, we don't talk about the next, uh, maybe actually what ring. You are, yeah, actually, the... what you brought up <laughs> is extremely important. So that is a, that is a, uh, that is a common thought of, of CERN in society that it is for physicists. Yes, exactly. But as you remember the, the pictures from the cavern, or we just discussed about the civil engineering, you can imagine that we need not only physicists, but also mechanical engineers. If you look at these superstructures, uh, we need electronics engineers. If you look at the, the electronic boards, these are custom made boards, most of them, for, especially for the trigger and the AQ. And of course you need uh, computing scientists because that's also needed. We have also some many space engineers for the cryogenics. For the exactly, yeah. exactly. So, space so, engineering. So, so, so this is extremely wide, uh, uh, the, the skills what we need. Uh, if you think of, of being an engineer in the future, that might surely fit for, for CERN as well, not only physicists. Yes, yeah, I, I would just add to that, that it would be an incredible experience to be an engineer working here at CERN. There's so many challenges that are unique to the kind of work that we do. And yeah, it involves, it, the goal is to do the physics, but along the way, there's so many other details and you need to, yes, directly work with uh, mechanical, electrical, computing engineers. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very exciting just at that aspect of the kind of variety of people that you get to work with as well. And let me add, okay, the, 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 the way, the approach to the world, okay? We were talking about to be meticulous, to observe, to correct, to collaborate. So this is something that we really hear, we can experience really for real, I would say. And then you can bring with you outside. We have many fellowships. I know at least uh, 10 people who were working for two years here and then now in the financial market making simulation, they do a lot of money. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but yeah. they are basically a building simulation just using different kind of numbers different sorts of numbers, but they're doing the same Monte Carlo method. Or uh, also, we need also lawyers. <laughs> so in case okay, we have- <laughs> bit, Let's just not go into this. <laughs> no, no, I, will, I would say that it's a small town. Yeah. And uh, I would like not to forget- This is, this is, like, this is like an industrial- so, yeah. Yes, technician, Actually, I met a lot of technicians. If you were paying attention, for example, we had some people from the fire brigade in the background. Oh, so yes. even, exactly. even that kind of, the kind of training that the fire brigade has to get- no, they, they just incredible. had a malfunctioning 
phone, maybe. Sonia didn't you touch the phone? The no, phone. no. Okay. Um, <laughs> but was one of these red yeah, phones but, just just malfunctioning now. Yeah, but they need to have training have to... for all kinds of things because exactly. like this is a very unique facility. Exactly. So that's also very. Last weekend, for example, we had a we had a, a safety test. This was a four-hour-long safety test. We simulated major. Uh, uh, accidents with, with the visitors, for mm -hmm. example, or with the gas system. And not only the CERN fire brigade came mm -hmm. uh, to help, but also the, the whole state uh, 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 systems were alerted. And, and actually, we had a large number of rescuing people here. We had to place panels by the roadside in order to, to tell the, the neighboring uh, residents that that was we, this this was something uh, a test and not a, not a real <laughs> yeah. major I, mean, I, I wasn't here but i heard there were helicopters so must actually one helicopter landed <laughs> even uh, but i think this was just the the cherry on the cake uh, -huh. uh more questions uh, we don't have more questions we have to go but we wanted to say thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, you. thank you very much. I think then, then we do too. Uh, yes, exactly. Thank you very much for, for coming today. And I hope that we can continue it pretty soon. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. Right. So have a nice, uh, you still have morning. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest of the day. Okay. Uh, all right. See you soon. Ciao, ciao. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.